lower everybody's hands, so just keep them up. I just want to know that everybody knows how to do this. Keep them coming. Uh, great, great job, everybody. Keep, keep, leave, leave it raised, I'll lower everybody. Perfect. All right, I'm satisfied with that, so I'm gonna lower everybody's hands. Um, and if you have questions, just put them in the chat and we'll, we'll try to help you out. All right, so uh, thank you for your cooperation with that and please enjoy tonight's Eloquence Educational Webinar. So I'm, I'm gonna now hand it over to my friend, Brian Schneider. Brian, take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. I'd like to welcome everyone to our ongoing webinar series, which we call Around the Spine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Minton, is Brian Schneider, and I'm a U.S. Director of Sales for Eloquence. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cholkem and Dr. Daniel Leach, who are gracious enough to share their many years of endoscopic spine experience with us tonight. I've had the pleasure of working with both of them throughout the years, and I'm certain everyone will walk away with a very good overview of how endoscopic spine technologies are quickly complementing fusion techniques. And we hope you enjoy tonight's presentation. And so without further ado, please allow me to introduce Dr. Kim to begin the discussion. Thank you very much. I should share my screen now, huh? Can you guys hear me okay? Whatever is right. Got you. Nice and clear. All right, perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, uh, talk with everyone about this topic that um, has been my new favorite uh, um, kind of uh, procedure. Uh, I think you'll get the sense of uh, my excitement for it. And I want to, so I want to thank uh, uh, Eloquence for um, organizing this in Seattle Science Foundation. We're making this look so pretty. And of course, my brother from another mother, Dan Leach, who um, is one of the colleagues that, it, that we grew up together from like when we were this big doing endoscopic surgery. And uh, he taught me a lot about how to do good endoscopic surgery. All right, so the title will be uh, Endo Telef, and we want to try to not talk about so much data that you're gonna basically get uh, fall asleep, but we want to talk about practical things and uh, really bring it down to earth. So let me start off by uh, disclosing my potential conflicts of interest. The biggest one is that I am a consultant for Eloquence, so um, take that into consideration as I give you the, uh, my presentation. But uh, I will try to be objective um, and Earth-like. But if I may be so bold, I would love to start out with a, um, uh, a survey question to get an idea of uh, how many discectomies uh, the people that are um, watching have performed? So can we pull up the, the, yes. Take like 20, 30 seconds. Um, we basically want to get an idea of how much experience you have. Um, that may kind of change the flavor of the, of the presentation and some of the questions and topics that we talk about. But, uh, I think we're almost done. Let's see where we're at. So we have a fair number of people that have not done any endoscopic discectomies. Um, so check this out. This is very similar to my MIS adoption rate. You either do one, two, or three cases and then just go, forget it, I'm gonna stop. Very few people will do like 10, seven to 10 cases or 11, 20 cases and stop. You either are doing well in the first few cases and become the person that does a lot of cases or you never get to do a lot of cases because you have a lot of problems at the beginning. So that very much falls in line with where we're at. So you guys didn't help me at all, but I will just try to make it more generalized so that uh, both ends of the spectrum can appreciate it. So let me start out with a case that uh, will give us some uh, food for discussion. So this is a 48-year-old uh, um, um, pediatric nurse. She's had back pain, neurogenic claudication, and she can't stand at work, and, and she works on, uh, um, on the floor as well as in the clinic. So uh, I think anybody that works on the floor, you know how much standing and walking we do. She has a hard time walking, and she likes to walk for exercise. So she's pretty miserable. And her ODI is 50, and here's her, her back pain, et cetera. And so even well, knowing that, that it's 50, you've already decided, hey, I got to do this MIS. If somebody's bigger, you know, there's so many advantages to go in MIS, whether it be through a tube or endoscopy like you're doing. I think that's 
definitely what people are going to do. So that's the first step to really Reed. point out. It's crazy. Now, this patient isn't that thin, but I just operated on somebody uh, Tuesday that was, you know, 300 something pounds. And um, when the bigger they are, the more important MIS is because it kind of takes the issue of size out. When you do open surgery on a very large patient, the incision just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that's one of the reasons why the complication rate gets higher uh, in large patients. Whereas when you do an endoscopic surgery, it doesn't matter if you're five pounds or 50 pounds, it's just one cannula. You just have to make sure that the cannula is long enough. So that is a huge advantage of MIS. Um, but this is, uh, you'll see, this is the ideal patient. She's not too f large, she's kind of normal. But look at her x-rays, flexion versus extension. Clearly there's some anterolysis that gets worse on flexion. And at three, four, there's a slight anterolysis, but I look more at this angular change. And I would say that uh, there's some degree of angular uh, and the chest stenosis there. And if you look at the MRI just at four, five, uh, here are the key, some of the characteristics that I'm looking at. Number one, look at how reduced the spondy is when you're laying down. That's another sign that tells me that this is a spondy that's mobile and, and that we can easily reduce. The other thing that tells me that is these uh, big fluid-filled fluid -filled facet joints. So I call this the facet fluid sign. When I see this, it tells me that there's lots of you know, hypermobility hyper there. Um, and again, with these two things together, I'm confident that um, I can do a very good indirect decompression. And then the last thing is that the stenosis isn't that bad. Now, it doesn't look that bad here because she's lying down and the, the spine is almost reduced. But when she stands up, the stenosis probably gets a lot worse. Point being that if I could not get the stenosis to look a lot better even when it's partially reduced, then I'd be nervous that an indirect decompression would be unsuccessful. That would give me pause to do an endoscopic T lift. But when you have somebody like this, young, healthy, uh, mobile spondies, fluid signs uh, indicating instability, and you know, not horrible stenosis, moderate to severe, this is basically the perfect endo T lift patient. And you know, I'm just drooling when a patient like this walks in the door. That's, and what is that? There's one thing I had when I was looking, you know, over the films, you know, you answered perfectly because I too saw that angular deformity on the flexion versus the extension on the x-rays. And that was in my head. I'm like, huh, I wonder why he jumped initially to just not doing four or five. That's what I had on the MRI, but definitely agree with that three, four, because you even see that joint open up, up at that three, four space too much. And when you lose that angle, when you change it, um, you have to do it. And I, so I totally agree with doing both levels when I really reviewed it. And this is very anecdotal, but I've had so many cases where I do uh, just this one right here and say, this doesn't look that bad. Even a trace of spondy, this level will probably break down in the future. In her, she was symptomatic here. So I'm in a case where this is her main symptomatology. This may or may not be causing symptoms. I would include this in the fusion because one of the things that patients hate is coming back for a second operation. No matter what they say, even if you've laid the crepe ahead of time, if you ever get to the second operation. So if you can do um, this operation without undue risk, in a 50-50 call, I'd rather make a mistake of commission than omission when it's a 50-50 call. I used to be the opposite. In that age group, she wants to be active. She is a nurse. She's going to be busy. And to say you may fail within two years, which I think she would, it's not a reasonable option. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm curious to see what other people uh, think. Uh, please use the chat feature to type in your thoughts. Um, I agree, I've kind of been looking and that's one person did mention, you know, what about three, four, they would have not jumped in right away. I'm looking to see if they're gonna come back and say, okay, we justified what you did. Um, so I'll hopefully right back if we convinced you or not yeah. on that. Yeah, I mean, it's a question of probabilities and possibilities. Yeah, hey, there are cases you can get away with not you, doing, you, uh, you would need you like a hand, I'm an expert. Yeah, and you convinced that person, so that's a good thing. Oh, I did? Okay, never mind then. <laughs> but that, uh, fusing up here is my opinion. It's, but this right here, I can say with high degree of confidence, I think most persons would fuse that. Yeah, okay. and is, people are, multiple people are pointing out where they would really like to see that MRI 
see the joints at three four. Of course, you know Joel had that ability to see more than you do, and you know I'm sure that that came in. And that's there's multiple multiple people writing about that right now. That if three four is what you said, they agree. Pull, I can pull up her entire imaging. It's just it's a hip issue. But I can just tell you when I show the three four level, about half will want to fuse it, and the other half will want to not fuse it. Fair enough. Um, so, uh, you'll see later that the inner body implant that we use for a, a percutaneous endoscopic inner body reconstruction is only eight millimeters in, in width, but it's 30 in length. So it's a relatively small footprint implant compared to a lateral A-lift device. So the ideal patient, and very few patients are ideal, I get that. I wish all my patients are like this, um, but the ideal patient has little to no osteoporosis. And remember this whole indirect decompression discussion? They have to be indirect decompression worthy. In other words, all signs should point toward it's likely that we'll be able to do a reasonably good inner body realignment and by doing so, achieve an indirect decompression. Except for like the disc decompression or foramenal decompression, it's hard to do a central decompression um, unless you get a good overall realignment of the inner body space. And she's definitely oh, that. Here's a question that somebody did have that a lot of people do rely on is the injections. Did you, did you have to proceed with injections at 3-4 to help convince you to do 3-4 or you were primarily off of films and symptoms? On her, I didn't uh, do a targeted injection, but I have to tell you, I rely so much on targeted injections and I asked my pain to put in, I used to ask them to put in a really dilute marking mixture together with the Depomedrol or the Kenalog or whatever. Uh, crystalloid steroid that's injected, but now if you use, uh, if you take um, one cc of the steroid and one cc of a 0.25 percent marcaine bupivacaine solution, so it'll end up being 0.125 something percent. Um, that almost never causes a motor deficit, and it'll have a really good diagnostic block effect. So I re that's one of my secrets to success. So whoever brought up that question. Um, uh, I'm surprised at how many people don't utilize that strategy because it doesn't matter what I do. If the patient doesn't wake up and they're, they're doing really, really well, I, I don't care what the x-rays look like. I don't care how fast the surgery was done. I don't care that it was MIS. Um, but the single best predictor of outcomes is the response to that target injection in those patients where there's a diagnostic uh, uh, dilemma. But I didn't have to do that on can I ask you one favor? Would you be able to back up and show us just the x-rays and the MRI one more time before we proceed on? Yes, so the here's the, I just put in the flex and extension views, but the um, AP and lateral aren't very revealing, so that's that. Yeah, just the flexion extension is again, people are just wanting to refresh what we're talking about because we cheat and we're looking at them all the time. Yep. Let me know when you guys are good. I have a question. Maybe Let's try using the raise your hand feature as a voting tool. How many of you guys can appreciate this slight antral thesis right here? I don't really know how to... I, mean, I can't see any of the hand raising, so can somebody call out how many people raise their hand? Yeah, I'm looking right now, Joel. There's not many. There's probably about okay. 10. How about no? Here there are plenty now up on top. There's probably about okay. thirty of the hundred and some on 160, 190 on. We'll move on. But how many do not see a spondy here? That's probably the better question. Because it is, it's very mild. But I see it up in front too. There's but you're right, only, the feeling of this only, level, I think, would generate tons of controversy and discussion. Yeah, there's only seven people didn't see the spondy, and I think you pointed out um, the best thing was just that angular deformity. You know, we all talk yep. about that, three millimeters and the angular deformity of five degrees. Well, I think that has that, and it's something I look at as well. Perfect. Yeah, as I become more and more mental invasive, I spend more and more time like really scrutinizing the preoperative imaging. I used to not do that that much because I'm trained as an open surgeon 
an open surgery, you, when you get in there, you see what everything's going on, and the imaging studies are kind of helping guide the way. With MIS, the imaging is your map. <laughs> Without that sucker, uh, it's really hard to know where you're going, and you need to know where everything is in three-dimensional space, not just in 2D space with extra. You have to, in your mind, superimpose the 3D anatomy onto the 2D right. intraoperative flow images. And I use navigation a little bit, but... We have a final answer. Jeff Rowe has said it is absolutely a spondy, so now we have an answer. Jeff Rowe! Yeah. He said it is, that's so we don't need to informal. talk about it anymore. Done. Yep, that doesn't even come up as an informal uh, panelist. Man. Okay, let's do another question. How many endoscopic training courses, labs, uh, like learning events like this have you been to? The reason why I ask this question is it's kind of funny. There's a group of people that I see over and over and over again. They're so in motivated, but I'm just wondering, like, when are they going to just start doing cases? You know, but, and that is, that is a tough thing. You know, it, to do cases, you've spent a lot of time in how to train people with your skin to skin, with what you're doing now. You've spent a lot yep. of time. Those are discussions in every company and every training thing we go to. That's kind of a mixture of it all over the place. Right. I probably went to at least six or more courses before I started. I went That's to a one. problem. I went to one course. <laughs> yeah, but us we're humans, we need to do a lot. So what did I end up uh, doing? I did a endoscopic lysis so if you look at the x-rays themselves, you can say a lot of things, and this is where it gets a little weird, but if you're more about what the patient's doing, it is, it's hard to put into like a paper or a study. You just have to see them. It's kind of like porn, you know, when you see it. They are so good. So this patient uh, went from whatever back pain score was pre-op to a back pain of two, uh, no leg pain, um, ODI is four, and uh, you know, she went home before midnight. And she's like spectacular, all the patients are. So the, she, the technique is, is not that like weird and bizarre. It is basically um, only different from an MIS TLIP in that the intrabody reconstruction is done through a little pocal, essentially percutaneously with endoscopic assistance. And we use a 10, you can do it a variety of different ways, but I use it a roughly 10, meter, a 10 millimeter cannula that's kind of rectangular at the end to fit inside the disk space. It goes into Kamen's triangle. And through that cannula, I do all the discectomy and, and plate prep uh, and, and cage insertion using um, like, like uh, the C-arm and the endoscope, but using what I call the force, where you're paying so much attention to e how everything feels, making sure that the lateral x-rays are perfect um, and, uh, you know, feeling like you have your little pinky out because you're being so gentle uh, with all your instruments. Um, and then in, there's an eight millimeter wide expandable space that will go in through that 10 millimeter cannula. Um, and it's, it's expandable so that uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't endanger the exiting nerve root as you go in. That's the biggest, scariest thing for me and probably most people um, and allows you to reconstruct patients that have relatively tall inner body space. And then once you do that, I make two separate perimeter incisions and put in the screws through um, essentially percutaneous pedicle screws. So it's almost like an MIT except for the percutaneous inner body, but turns out that small difference makes a huge difference in terms of post-operative pain and rate of recovery. And I'm in the middle of doing that. So um, here's how I do it. But first, let me ask you one more question. I'm curious to know how many people have done either an endoscopic assisted or a percutaneous T lift. Well, you don't take down the facet joints, you work right through Kamen's triangle. Because this procedure was, was, uh, is not new, and it's been done a lot with a cannulated spacer that's non expandable. It's done without using the endoscope to make sure everything's clear in the annulotomy window. Um, and my guess is, is that there's tons of postoperative radiculitis. You know, Cholin, I've only done anywhere between, I think the number is more around five to six of these. And um, I really, my issue was wanting to clean it all out, 
I definitely am a person who comes in the canal as a part of how I do my endoscopic stuff. So I cleaned it out that way too. It was a time and then it hit where if I took the time I could clean the disc out, but I had the problem with the cages and we've spoken before, I think as that technology keeps coming, the different cages, the lordosis, the expandable, I think then it really does open it up where I'm gonna jump back in and do these. You've been treating me again, but I think technology has caught back up that it's time to re-enter this, at least for me. Yep. I would say that the te technology right now is there for men to do the surgery really well, but you have to be like, you have to be, you, know, you have to be like me where I check my car alarm like two or three times before I come in. You know, I, well, I set my car alarm and I get halfway out the parking lot and I'm like, beep, it's, a, it's set. And then I get to the edge of the parking lot and I'm like, beep, it's definitely set. It's maddening, but um, if you're really, really precise and you're really careful, you can get great results now but there's a whole field where we can make this so much easier. Um, it, it but chose, that's probably it, of another discussion. It, so it looks like most people have never done an endotelus. Yeah. You good? Yeah. It sounded like you're about to ask. All right, so this is, I took my, my cheesy YouTube video and kind of tried to shorten it a little bit and I removed all the sound. I'm going to talk over it. That's what this is. So bear with me. I think it's pretty good in terms of giving you an idea of what is involved. So the first thing I do is I identify the entry point using the 18 gauge needle. I don't draw 50 million lines that end up being not accurate. So I try to draw some lines, get a good entry and I stick the needle in and if the needle goes down the trajectory, I make the incision right there. If not, I make the incision slightly above or below. Once so I make that how, how do you how do you really pick that point though? How do you draw your lines? What lines I do you first use? make sure that uh, yeah I should have talked about that. I first make sure that the patient's perfectly AP at the level that I'm operating on relative to the floor, and then I come under and I get a perfect lateral at the level that I'm going to operate on, and then I just take the pencil, the, the solid big dilator or any straight metallic instrument, and um, I go about 10 to 15 centimeters out from the midline. And I put that metallic pointer on the skin where I roughly think it's gonna be the entry point. I take a lateral x-ray and I start adjusting that. And I look for two things. One, I wanna have a slight cephalad trajectory. I should have shown that. And I want the entry point to be slightly, to be either at the tip of the spinous process or slightly dorsal. I don't wanna be anterior to the spinous process because my guess is that it's gonna to be too lateral and it may go retroperitoneal part way. And I don't want to be so far steep that I cannot get into the canal if there's a disc herniation that I need to get to. And I want to get a certain angle so that I can get a white cage. So um, I want to be 10 to 15 centimeters out, slight cephalodicata trajectory, um, and on the lateral x-ray at the tip of the spinous process. Sound good? Fair enough. And when I when I get that, I'll make the mark and I'll stick the 18 gauge needle and start aiming. And if it's like, I can tell, I should have started that one centimeter earlier. I haven't made the incision yet, so I can just numb everything up. And when I make the incision, I just make it slightly smaller. Once I have a little stab incision, I take that thin initial dilator. And this is the step right here. I use that to walk to Kamben's triangle instead of the needle. So that's the first little change that I did. Instead of using the needle to get to Kamben's triangle, use the initial dilator. When you get the initial dilators docked on the working triangle, then you can inject the blue dye. And not everyone needs the blue dye, but I'm using it. Can I interrupt a second? Just the question, you know, really with going in, as we look at some of our friends talking about doing awake, you know, endoscopic fusions or awake, normal fusions, talking about ERAS protocols, et cetera, there's questions coming in. And I have that question myself. Do you use any special anesthetics? Do you use Expirel or something fancy, or what do you do? Um, that's a very good question. I know that people do this uh, awake, but in my hands, I think if, uh, in most cases, it's, it's safer in a prone position um, to control the airways. So uh, Dan is the one, Dr. Leach is the one that convinced me to start doing these surgeries, even the discectomies under general anesthesia with uh, really good EMG um, neuromonitoring, and 
I don't know if I'm just getting better, but my results are better, and I'm just so much happier in the OR. I can yell at people, I can listen to music, and I don't have the patient incessantly asking me the same question over and over again, uh, or you know, distracting me from focusing on the surgery. Uh, so I really like doing it under general anesthesia. So unless okay. the patient has like an, a reason why they can't have an anesthetic, I don't really see the need to do this awake because the anesthetic tends to be light. And so that's, that's, the way I get around the issue with the nerve um, is to use really good uh, neuromonitoring. And I, I don't do triggered EMGs that much, but I make my neuromonitoring tech call out every burst and spike, the side, the muscle group, um, the magnitude, so that as I'm operating, I get a sense of what's positive and negative. And when I get right here, when I get down there, I will tap the end and the um, scrub tech will put their hand on the butt cheek and I'll wait for the neuromonitoring person to say, I don't hear anything. Once I, so this is the initial dotted right of Camden's triangle. Once I do that, I can stick the needle down there and not fuss around with trying to use a flexible needle to drive this thing precisely where I need to get to. And once I have the needle in, I can inject the dye. I really like the blue dye because when you look in there with an endoscope, everything looks the same. With the blue dye, you just get instantaneous feedback, and it's just much more, it's, it's less cumbersome. It's not necessary, but either is a 500 horsepower car. Yeah. But it's nice to have it. So with your dye, you do methylene blue, and do you do Omnipay 300 with that, or what do you do? I don't even remember what the uh, formula is anymore because I have such good pH, but I have all that written down. So if somebody uh, wants to know like the recipe for my pie, um, including um, all the all the stuff, the irrigation and where I get all the different equipment, um, I can share that with you. Okay. Like the picklet and stuff like that. I have a whole huge checklist that my PA put together. I'm happy to share that with you. In fact, I insist before you do your first case because if you're not organized, It'll become a cluster. All right, now, here is probably the biggest thing that people, when I show them this part, they, their eyes, like, their eyebrows go up and like, you're gonna do what? Let me back this up. All right, so, the way you open up the neural frame is, after each of these dilators, there's an end cutting reamer that reams from the outside, and here's the outer one. And when you ream across here, um, and I remember Jeff Rowe came to visit me while I showed him how to do this. He's like, you're gonna do what with that outer reamer? You're crazy. <laughs> I've done it a thousand times and it's safe, but you can't be a brute. You have to be really gentle and you have to rely on the ligamentum flavum acting like a thick drape that will push the dural tube away. But if you just go barreling in there without even paying attention, you can get past the ligamentum flavum. But usually the ligamentum flavum becomes confluent with a facet joint capsule and that acts like a really thick drape that protects the exiting nerve root as you as you're reaming and pushes it out of the way so, now, so let, me, let me ask with that because i do the same and i've really lived by that was do you go to an ap to make sure you're not at the beginning when you're going ahead you have your lateral you're trying to hit that point coming walking down that facet hitting that sap taking some of the sap do you then go to an AP to make sure you're not crossing over into the dural zone? You're not bypassing that medial pedicular line or do you just stay in the lateral? I stay in the lateral. I used to go in the AP because we used to go in the AP, I think this is a Tony Young thing, where when you ream with the reamer, you do not want to go past the medial bar of the pedicle. The problem with that is, is that sometimes you don't ream deep enough and remove the tip of the superior articular process. The only way to do that is in the lateral. So there is some degree of a blind pass by not looking at the AP, but if you um, are really careful and maintain um, control over the device, that ligamentum flavum will protect you. And um, if you don't go all the way in and you put the endoscope down, you'll have this bony wall that will prevent you from getting inside the canal and then it doesn't matter. <laughs> You'll be so frustrated. So you can go into the AP, but you need to make sure that on the lateral, the reamer goes all the way to the disc space and past that little edge. And a lot of it you can feel as you go down. So when I'm going down and reaming, I'm feeling, and I'm also looking at the floral, uh, and I'm being really, really anal. Well, and that's if you exactly. 
many, many times without problems. It's a yeah. very reliable strategy. And again, that's a classic orthopedic thought process. The neurosurgeon thought process is that ultimate paranoid. And I think just to get over that, I do always look, the perfect spot for me is the anterior part of the canal, that medial pedicular, the most inner part of it, because I know I'm as over far. And as soon as I'm beyond that point with my needle, with my guides, as soon as I'm beyond that, I have no more dura to worry about. And then it's so easy, especially with the bigger instrumentation, you can ream everything and you're golden and you're going to get across three quarters way right away. So again, you're gonna I just do that on the lateral, right? I, I do lateral and then I just make sure when I think I'm where I want to be, I make sure one time in an AP because then it's always in my head on the lateral where my brain knows I am in that AP. You know what? I should do that too now. It's, I'm going to start doing that. Too. That's a really good idea. Yeah. You just because you if you don't know, know two, two, three, for example, really high up on mm -hmm. a lateral image, you may think that you're like steep enough, and you get an AP, and everything's like at the midline already, and you start reaming, you will get it. I should do that. I probably do that when I'm at uh, two, three, or three, four, and uh, not at four, five, and five, one. But Understood. when you're starting, you should get the AP. You're right. Understood why. All right, so when I put the, when I exchange the, the thinner, more smooth endoscopic cannula with the cannula that I need to put in the cage, it's kind of, it's squared off so I cannot rotate it. You just have to pound it straight in. And every once in a while, I'll pound that in, and as I get, as I start to hit it in, the neural monitoring just goes haywire, but it starts to fire. You shouldn't just keep going. You should just take that out, put the endoscopic cannula back in, and look in there and root around. And you want to make sure that uh, there's no edge of the nerve sneaking in over the cannula. You want to make sure that the nerve itself, either the exiting or the traversing nerve root dural membrane, isn't scarred down to epidural tissue. And you know, even like a little reticular fiber along the end, if you drag it in, it can scratch and pull on the exiting nerve root. And you get a ridiculitis. So. The part where um, it's really important is you just need to make sure that you can go into the annulatomy window back and forth over and over again without endangering the nerve root. All right, now, once you have that cannula down, the surgery gets so fun because I've come to uh, fine tune all the instruments and I pretty much use two instruments. Um, the first instrument is this rotating brush. Look at this sucker. So a couple of things. One, you want this cannula deep enough so that you do not have any nerve coming in here. Because can you imagine if you had that spinning brush and it went by the nerve, you can scratch it. So you want this arch to be at the posterior visible body line or anterior. This watch, I'll probably back it up. And if I'm worried, I'll put an endoscope in there and make sure visually that it's totally clear. And once I have that, I'll debulk the uh, disc, and the fast way to do that is to stick this rotating wire brush. And I'll show you a closer picture of it. And it's attached to this drill, and it spins relatively quickly. It's like a pin driver. Can I and interrupt I'm, pinch roll? Yeah, but Where? let me make one point. I've got the death grip on this cannula because that it's backing up a little bit. You do not want that cannula back up inadvertently without you knowing about it and pulling it out. There it is right there. So is the cannula you use is it beveled where it's protecting the anterior surface uh -huh. of the dura or so you're still with a beveled you're in all the way and that's going to further protect you right and the bevel is angulated kind of in a way that matches the angle of your entry point so theoretically it should be kind of a almost a square entry into the annulus okay let me see if i have a picture of all right, so, so this is what it looks like when I take it out. And I don't know how, how, if you guys feel the same way. When I do a discectomy and amplate prep with the curettes, ah, oh, geez, I hate that stuff. It's so tedious. Like pieces of disc are just getting all over my gloves. My sucker is getting clogged. And I, you know what I mean? This is so fun. You just stick it in there, and it's almost like a Velcro. It sticks there. Hey, Charles, so not only does it debulk it, but it has that... Um, that bayonet, you can even put a bigger angle and you can 
I want to show you that, but. So, Joel, um, definitely no. It will. Yeah, play. I so agree. Like cleaning out that disk space is just the ultimate importance. But it appears, you know, and when as you're leading up to that, there was a picture on the video that it did show your navigation, and it did show a couple other black ports that look like they might be where pedicle screws go, but I don't see any screws on the study, you know, that we looked at. Is that something that you use to help guide you into the disk space or no? I use complete, I use floral for getting into this space completely. I use uh, um, 3D navigation to put in the screws. And have you done that already or what were those black ports? Accurate enough to rely purely on navigation. Because navigation is off by one to two millimeters and it'll still say it's okay. Two millimeters is an eternity in <laughs> Cabin's Triangle. So um, in situations like this, if I were using navigation, I'd still have the floral in there and looking to make sure that the cannula is not pulled out, make sure that it's perfectly aligned, parallel to the disk space and plates, and I need to see this brush. Yes. So I don't think we're gonna get rid of the C-arm anytime soon with this part. Now, besides this, and this is really good at removing end plate cartilage, I have this thing called the Batman. You have to be so careful. So this is a custom Batman where only one end is cutting and the other end is blunt so that it's not cutting. And two things. One, you have to get a perfect lateral x-ray, and you have to come in as parallel as possible. And you want to be, like, watching this with an eagle eye because it is so easy to gouge the end plate. Once you score the end plate, that thing just keeps propagating. And there it is. That's the sharp end. And then this. So it is possible to take and compromise those end plates with the brush or just the Batman? I've not been able to do it with the brush easily, but I'm sure if you just sit there, it will happen. Um, you have to try. But with that rotating shaver, you have to try not to gouge the end plate. Yeah. Now, once I do all those steps, I'll look inside and I'll examine the end plate. And there'll inevitably be, inevitably be areas where I need to do more work, just some fine tuning. But you can already see right here. Look how good that is right there. And look how good that is right here. I just need to get a few more things. And here's the tiger striping. So here's the side firing laser. If it's a small area, this is a great way to very precisely remove the end plate cartilage down to bleeding bone. You can see that right here. If it's a large area, then I'll put back in the rotating shaver and the brushes and keep working. And the Element Probe probably works too, especially now that they have this dual lead Element Probe that's much has a much bigger surface area that's working and it's much more aggressive. Um, but it should look like this. There should be no end plate violation. Look, I got a little violation there, but that's the back. And then I'll go in there and I'll do a couple of things. I'll palpate around. And I'll use this to kind of tell me where I am in three-dimensional space because under an endoscope 2D view, it's hard to tell where you are. Like, am I anterior, am I posterior, am I lateral? When you piece together the endoscopic view with the X-ray view, you know exactly where you are in 3D space. If you don't know where you are in 3D space, stop and do whatever you need to do to sort that out because I would say the majority of my mistakes have been I didn't appreciate where I was exactly and I didn't take enough imaging studies. You know, once you do all that, put in a little cage right there. Sorry. You know what's nice? You know, the discussion going on is really nice, and Ray Gardaki had a really great point that with okay, the Ray Gardaki is another master endoscopic surgeon. Absolutely, and he has a great point that you know you definitely can use. And he's like, hey, why didn't you just use the endoscope to go ahead and see where you're placing your port to see where you are doing all these things with your cannula insertion, so you don't have to worry. And that's the good thing. You always can back up and make sure you're safe. When you're yep. going ahead and using brushes, when you're going ahead and get ready to put your cage with the endoscope, you always have the ability to look around, use just what you did where you use an Elman probe or whatever probe your choice is. That's always my favorite, the bipolar, because it just feels right. I right love that. Button. It's just the best to look around, to navigate, to remove a big disc herniation. It does everything. but. Ray's point, I think, is so good. You always have that in safety. You always can stick something in there and then take the x-ray and seeing it, you always know where you are, and that is the safety of the whole thing. 
Yeah, I'm curious to, to get a real life number on the post operative radiculitis rate when, they, when this is done purely percutaneously without ever looking down there. So if there's anybody in the audience that has experience with that, can you um, either come up and tell us and, and, and describe to us what you've seen or just put it in the chat. But my okay. guess is that there'll be a 20% rate of post operative radiculitis that's significant without going in there with the endoscope. And I get that. Um, because in 20% of the cases, if I don't put it in the endoscope, I cannot get that outer channel in without the neural monitoring going crazy. And my experience with uh, endoscopic discectomy and a lot of other things, when the free run EMG neural monitoring starts going crazy, as you're tapping on something, okay. it's usually a real thing. And Go I ahead. listen to that do work, and then when I re-institute that maneuver, all of a sudden the activity goes way down. So I think there's something real to that. And without the endoscope, I don't know how you could do that. Hey, Joel, let me go ahead and ask. We have everybody. If anybody's done what Joel's describing, please just raise your hand, and I'll see if the host can, like, jump you in to chat about this, because I think that would be important to hear from you. Does anybody have yep, the question? Can you do this without the endoscope safely? And what's the, uh, what's the post upper radiculitis rate? Has anybody All right. Yeah, look at this. Look at this, you know inner body space, it is really hard to put in a 12, 13, 14 millimeter spacer into this little annulotomy window without endangering the nerve root, at least in my hands, and I'm pretty certain that's in most people's hands. Yeah, we yeah. should develop that most people can do. So um, I really think that having the endoscope available, looking in there, making sure the nerve is free, making sure that it's not in your surgical corridor as you go in and out with all these scary looking devices, is uh, important to make the surgery go well. And, 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 and this is nice. Kevin Lawson has done it both ways. And um, he really does feel it's nice having another endoscope. Exactly. And so it, it is. He did it just with a st stimulated um, cannula. And then he's done it also looking. And he's like, hey, why not use both? Because you're using two things. Again, it's all about safety. Got to agree with Kevin on that. Now, ask him if he uh, noticed the difference in the postoperative radiculitis rate. So this is a 4551 case. I think you just did, but he's saying it's 10%. For both or for, for? I'll wait for that answer, Kevin. Okay. So here's just a radiographic summary of what I did at 51. And, you know, it's so fast. I think um, you know, this surgery will probably be done at two level in two or three hours. So the last two levels that I did endoscopically was the first time I operated in a month and it, we did two levels without even rushing because we're like, what did we do for this again? It took two hours and 45 minutes. So making this successful requires an incredible amount of, you know, kind of uh, attention to these details that normally you wouldn't pay attention to. Now I put the screws in first now, but by the way. So, so Kevin does give us, he said, you know, he thinks it's 10% just stim stimulated cannula, and he hasn't done enough with the scope to really be able to compare and give us a number. Yep. So I'm gonna talk about post-operative radiculitis after this surgery. So this is the patient. I mean, she is so happy. I think this is her one month post-op visit. But like her one month post-op visit was like, she just walked right in. And so you can tell she's not the most fit person in the world. So Joel, as far as the cage goes, being able to expand it, is that a cage you can tell where you are by the x-ray? Are there little markers that line up or anything, or you just have to get used to putting it in? And the, so with that, what kind of bone graft are you able to use with that case, and what do you rely on? Okay, so um, you, it's really hard to tell where the back end of the cage is. So. Um, Depending on which cage you use, try to figure that out. And if it's expandable, you can start expanding it, and I'll tell you where it is. Um, but you'll see in a second. I try to get the big, the longest cage in there possible because it's only eight millimeters wide. So let me get to that in a second about um, how I position the cage and what I do to make sure that it's not going to impinge upon anything important. So um, you know, I keep going on about how awesome this is. Is there is there support in the literature? And turns out. This is not new. This has been going on for a while, and there's tons of, not tons, there's a significant number of uh, peer-reviewed publications. The most recent one is by Jim Yu, together with the Morgan Stearns, and I think this is a case series of about 100, and they're doing great. 
So it works. The problem is the adoption's terrible, and there's got to be a reason for that. And we can probably have you know a big discussion on it. I think we have a survey question, actually. Let me see. All right, let's do the survey question. Because I have a very strong thought about it, but I'm curious to know what other people think may be the biggest obstacle for them pursuing this in earnest and making a, a big part of their day-to-day you know, -day practice. Because I would say I do more endo -telus now than I do mi -telus and laterals combined, wow. which is compared to a year ago, a year and a half ago. I did about almost uh, probably 60% of my T left, 40% uh, lateral. That's fantastic. Now, the goal of all this for me is that I want to be like the ortho sports guys because the ortho sports guys are the happiest surgeons that I know. You know why? <laughs> they don't have to round. They don't get that phone call in the middle of the night like, Mrs. Jones is itchy. Can I have a Benadryl order? And it's like, yes, and scratch her too. And they don't have to round. Rounding is a waste of time. You don't get anything out of it. You just feel obligated to do it. And it's just a, an, ep, an exercise in futile, crazy, silly questions that they will not remember and ask you again the next day. So, um, Hey, Joel, here's a just want to jump back so we don't miss this because I'll forget. Um, I believe the cage you used might have been a Globus expandable. But what about who makes those brushes, um, the Batman? Oh, but they're all Globus, okay. Yeah, so the cage, the cannula, the brushes, and the Batman is made by Globus. By the way, I should have circled Globus since I'm going to show, I get, um, uh, I'm a consultant for them and I get royalties on the pedicle screws and some of the cages. And the okay. new cage is coming out. So um, keep that in mind as I talk about expandable cages. Because I'm a big believer in expandable cages, but I, I'm a big expandable cage design team guy too. All yeah. right, looks like, what, what that tells me is that, um, I'm always fearful that somebody, that a lot of people are going to answer one. Very few people, as I ask just about MIS in general, state this as a reason why they haven't adopted it. But when, like, industry people go to thought leaders and key opinion leaders in the, in the, um, in, uh, in the universities, get what an get, guess what answer they give? They most often say the reason why you're not, the people aren't adopting MIS especially endoscopic, is this right here. But when I just ask a big group of people, it's never this. It's always something practical, like I'm not going to get paid for it, and it costs too much for unit reimbursement, or um, it just seems technically way too difficult. That's, you know, I, it's my computer. I, I just apologize. All right, so... Um, Reimbursement is a major issue with um, endoscopic discectomy surgery. It turns out it's not that big of a deal for fusion surgery because they're not sophisticated enough to dictate whether or not we can do the inner body with an endoscope or not. So I think it's totally reasonable to the inner body reconstruction however you want um, because you're not going to bill for an endoscopic surgery. You're going to bill for an inner body fusion, and I think that's totally legit. So the reimbursement issue for endo t lifts is a non-issue. Uh, reimbursement for a discectomy for a herniated disc using the endoscope versus a microscope, um, big problem. Issues. But my thoughts are the main thing is people just do not like learning new things when you're already an expert at something else. It would be like you're an expert skier, and I try to convince you to be become a snowboarder, even though it's way cooler. Sorry. When I said that 10 years ago, it was true. Like, the skiers were kind of like the nerds and the snowboarders were the cool people and snowboarding was way cooler, but it's changed. But you know, using that old analogy where you're like this old skier, if you're an expert skier, you're not going to want to learn how to do a good, and you don't want to, you're not going to want to become a snowboarder, even though it's cooler and funner because there's no need. If you were kind of not that great at skiing, then it's much easier. That's my hypothesis. And most of the people that we're trying to teach, are already expert skiers, and we're trying to convince them to to become a snowboarder because it's way sexier and the chicks dig it. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, so, if we make the learning curve easy, then my guess is is that there will be less resistance. So, I want to use the rest of the talk to talk to you about you know my learning curve experience essentially, because I just started doing endotelas about a year and a half ago, and guess what? The cases didn't start out perfect. So here's my, I've done 30 now, 
but these are the 17 where I have at least six months of uh, follow up. They're all fused, or they are. none of them have any signs or symptoms of pseudoarthrosis. Um, you know, they're varying in age. They're mostly in the Medicare group. Um, I wish I could operate on more 48 year olds, but not many 48 year olds need surgery. It's mostly spondyl stenosis. And the results, you know, this is typical of many studies. They're getting better, statistically significant. It doesn't show, though, how ecstatic they are about this. Like if this one week mark, they just look so good. And I did 17 patients. The average length of stay is less than one day. Three of the patients went home in post-op day zero, and 14 stayed on post-op day one. I'm pretty certain I could have gotten way more on post-op day zero. And getting patients home early is not any one thing. It's not endo T lift, and that's it. It's doing the endo T lift technique. It's doing ERAS protocol. We should talk about that too. It's about preparing the patient and their family members about how long they're going to stay. Um, because you have to tell them literally five, six times that they're going to go home the same day or the very right. next morning. Because if one person, is like the classic thing is, oh, I was at Bonds and a physical therapist behind me said, oh, you just had back surgery? You shouldn't be bending, twisting, and turning. I'm like, you listen to a physical therapist that you don't even know, not me? They will always refer back to the, somebody told me I was going to be in the hospital for five days, so I planned it for five days, and they will not leave. Or they're for a few days. The, the insurance person says, oh, yeah, we're giving you three days, so they want five. You know, it's... Yep. It is. They don't understand necessarily that going home in one day. Like going home earlier is better, but uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, educating, reminding, and reinforcing that it's better to go home when you're ready to go home. And I have, like, this little... Set, like I have a little road map where each one has these little criteria, like, I can get up out of bed by myself. I'm peeing okay. My pain's under reasonable control with oral pills. All these little things. If they can do all those things, I tell them it's better to go home and they have something to follow. And that's been very effective. I'm happy to share that too. It's really what I call the law of cumulative incremental improvement. I do 10 things every single time. And if I miss one thing, something bad happens. But if I just implemented one thing, it makes no difference. All 10 things need to happen all at once. Uh, almost like a perfect storm, but in the other direction. So. Um, it helps to be very anal. Now, as hard as I tried, I got three post-operative radiculopathies. So uh, the three that I got were in the first 12 or 13 patients. I have one more after this in about 30. That, I got one from 13 to 30. So you see what I'm saying? Three out of 12 versus one out of 22. You can see that the post-operative radiculopathy, radiculopathy rate is going down. How did I come to that? How did I get there? I noticed that when I look back there, there's a couple of things that is clearly you should not do. So I always joke, I'm like a really good expert in what not to do. So if you ask me something, I may not know what to do, but I'll know pretty much what not to do. And what not to do is one, attack somebody that has severe neuroframal stenosis with a partial motor deficit. So here's a patient that has a nerve that's already vulnerable because it's already not working very well. And you're trying to get into Kamen's triangle in the setting where that poor nerve is already very close to your surgical corridor and probably being pinched. And as you start dialing that up, you take this poor nerve that is not doing very well and you irritate it and they get temporarily worse. They, all, all my patients got better, by the way. And I'm sure there's a few other things, but uh, we need to kind of sort that out. But for right now, you can just, Eliminate those patients, and I think you can get to one out of 22 postoperative radiculitis rate if you use the endoscope today. What else did I learn? What else could I tell you that you could, I could save you from the, the trauma and agony that I had to endure looking at these x-rays? What I discovered is that the inner body reconstruction is truly very difficult. I knew it was going to be difficult, but once you start doing it, it's, it's difficult on a variety of different fronts. But let me just show you on, like, how sexy is your x-ray, Dr. Kim? So um, I took the first three, the middle three, and the last three sets of my first 15 cases. And this is too small, I'm gonna blow it up, but you can just, if you just compare these, here's my first three. So this is my first case, he was a physician, he's like 80 something, he's had two recurrent, he's had a, a disc herniation and then two recurrent disc herniations. And finally I just said, we gotta fuse you. So we fused him, looks terrible. 
He's doing great, though, because we did a discectomy, too, with the endoscope. Um, and he's, he's stellar. This is the second patient. Got a two-level spondy. Um, I don't show this, but if on the flexing interviews, this is not nearly as mobile as the other patient. And guess what happened? I didn't do a very good job of uh, realignment and probably didn't do a very good job of indirect decompression, in part because look at how much subsidence I've gotten. See that? These are 26 millimeter long by eight millimeter wide cages, and you can see how greedy I got. And then here's a third case, a little bit better. I got some height, but some subsidence still, right? Here's seven, eight, and nine. Seven kakapupu, eight kakapupu. Nine is starting to look pretty good. And then here's 13, 14, and 15. This is an osteoporotic patient where I had to, you know, do, give it some help. And even with that, this is not a perfect lateral, but that looks pretty dang good compared to this spondy. It's taller, more reduced. Same thing here. This is the one that we showed. And then this is the case presentation I showed at the very beginning. All nine of these patients are spectacular. In fact, all 30 of the patients are expect, uh, doing unbelievably well. I'm waiting for somebody to, to really, you know, fall off, but it's gonna happen. So how do I get there in terms of the inner body reconstruction to make the x-rays look good? Number one, B. McCoy. So you know McCoy in Star Trek? He always says, um, damn it, Jim, I'm a surgeon, not something else. Well, McCoy's not a surgeon. He's an interventional radiologist. You know why? All surgeons of the future are interventional radiologists. He just takes the tricorder. And for us, I'm almost like a pain guy. I mean, I don't do any surgeries without intraoperative imaging. At the very least, really good floral and almost always, uh, if it's any kind of reconstruction, 3D navigation. So, uh, so see how careful I have everything here. I try to get the most perfect lateral. I have the cannula directly parallel to the end plates and I make sure that this thing is deep enough that this little arc is not door, uh, posterior to the posterior vertebral body line. This is the opening and I'm well inside the, this space and when I spin this, I want, I mean, can you imagine if this went out the front? So this is a really effective tool, but you have to use it like, um, like a surgical instrument. This does the vast majority of the work. It does the nucleotomy and it removes most of the end plate. Uh, if you get crazy, it will gouge the end plate, but it's really good at just scraping out the cartilage. And sometimes, or mo most of the time, I see little strips of uh, cartilage left over that looks like tiger stripes. And I use this to very gently go back and forth and do uh, end plate scraping. And I'll look inside there with the endoscope. And here's a closer picture of that device. That's cutting. You can't tell that's a 90 degree L shape, but this is really blunt so that the only thing cutting is on one side. It gives me a lot of tactile feedback exactly where I am. And I usually stick. If you don't have your little pinky out, like you're holding a key up, you're not being gentle enough, you just have to be so anal. And in the end, you want to have something like this. You want to have a long, clear swath of end plate cartilage. And I'll take the um, side firing laser, Elman probe, or if, if uh, I can, use the brushes or the rotating shaver to get all this some more. But usually I have to use some kind of device like uh, um, like the laser or the Elman probe. Here's the Elman probe. And then I want to use the longest cage possible. So if you put the cage in like this, you can only put in a cage from here to here. If you put in a cage in lateral, you can put in the longest cage. Obviously, you don't want to do that because you're going to go into the retroperitoneal space. So I take a pretty flat trajectory where the starting point is at the top of the spinous process and it's no further out than 15 centimeters because the cannulas are 15 centimeters long. And you can just see how f close it gets to the posterior vertebral body line. The reason why you can't hit this more anterior here is that this is not in the middle. This is way over here. So if I keep hitting this, this will poke out the uh, anterolateral annulus, uh, which may not necessarily be a bad thing, by the way, but that's a topic of another discussion. But you can just see when I use these eight millimeter wide cannulas, I try to fill this whole space as best as possible. When I do an MIC up, I don't necessarily do that. I try to just get it right in the front. Here's a, here's a question. Um, Somebody's just wondering if they can put two cages in, just taking the extra time and just going down. Is there a shorter cage available so that you can do more what would be like a plif, so you have bilateral cages and try to fill the center with bone? 
I've been wanting to do that. I think that will be huge. So um, I think the concept there is that um, if you had a problem going unilaterally, you can easily fix it by just going to the other side. That's true. I have a saying, you can fix any MIT lift problem by just going to the other side. And, and you can do that same here. Now, if you had like a pretty big, great spondy or the patient was osteoporotic or you just wanted to have like a lot of inner body uh, lifting height, going bilateral would be awesome. But guess what? It's twice as much work, basically. And it's awkward working backwards with the C arm on the other side. Yeah, and I did do I one of my one of my five or six was done like that, and you're exactly right. It just was so much time for me that um, I thought it was a great idea until <laughs> until I was doing <laughs> until it. you started doing it, and it wasn't. Yeah, it's sort of like reading. Yeah, seems like a great idea until you sit down and start reading, and you realize it's so boring. And, I, and again, I realized it's just me needing to get more facile, me needing to get faster, and. Someday, hopefully, if I want to do that, I can. Or if I need to do that, I will. I bet you you're going to need to do it one of these days. And, yes, they make these down to, I think, 22, 26, and 30. That work. So if I put in bilateral, I want to put in two and really put it in the anterior half to allow this to close down and uh, have a much more lordotic operation. So let's say I was doing an endotela for one reason. And sagittal alignment was important in this particular patient. Then I'd probably go bilateral. i probably do some fenestration of the anterior annulus in ALL, that's an advanced technique, and I put in two short cages and I have a very um, sagittal trajectory so that it's as close to the lateral cortical uh, edge as possible um, and really crank it up and use the shorter cages and only crank up the anterior half of the disc space and um, try to close down the posterior half. And the, your, your dilator, your cannula that you put in is 10 millimeters? It's 10 millimeters right here, but it's eight, like eight, nine millimeters right here. So this cannula uh, tapers down so that it has two flat edges to match up with the, with the disc space. It's not round down here. I got These it. two flat sides, so, uh, but it's effectively a 10 millimeter cannula. Okay. Whereas the endoscopic cannula just for the endoscopic discectomies is eight millimeters and you can rotate it and by rotating it you use the tongue to sweep things out of the way once this is you can't rotate it because it's fit in like a key in the disc space so that's why i will often exchange cannulas if i have any trouble all right i've been talking forever sorry about that so here's my kind of thoughts on the surgery without getting too crazy. the biologic you use or the bone you use okay um it's, this is totally off-label, so I don't know if it's cool, but uh, um, it's, I use uh, BMP off-label. All right. And I just started using I-Factor, um, but I haven't done enough. But with BMP, I use BMP for my laterals and my MIC lifts. If you know how to use BMP properly, it is so good. The fusion rate is just sky high. I can't remember the last time I had a pseudoarthrosis that I had to repair. And if you kind of you know, use low doses, you irrigate, uh, you contain the um, uh, BMP, and I even use a fiber sealant every time to seal in the, fiber, uh, the BMP inside the disc space. My uh, post-operative radiculitis rate, bony overgrowth rate, and you know, osteolysis rate has plummeted to the point where it's, it occurs once in a blue moon, but the fusion rate is so high that it's totally worth it. So you do do that? You know, I, oh, yeah, I love BMP, but my guess is, is that um, you don't need it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I found you need to contain that I factor as well. Yeah. Oh, really? You really do. Trust me on that. <laughs> okay, I, I trust you. All right, I love this surgery. Why? Because in my hands, it is comparable and better, clearly, than all my other MIST lift operations. It's not as versatile as an MIST lift, uh, and it can't accomplish everything, and I still need MIST lift, lateral, and all the other tools in my toolbox, but... Um, it says something when I very quickly migrate to doing one surgery a lot more than the other, um, and it's been a while since I've done that. And the most important thing is, is that you can clearly see it in the patients in the first month. It's just two different patients. Um, I think the best way to think about it is that if you do a microdiscectomy, you think, like, that is a great operation, because it is. A microdiscectomy is an awesome operation. But guess what? If you do an endoscopic discectomy, 
and you see those patients post up, it is like a different patient. They're like even better. And I would love, uh, we have a lot of really advanced level uh, uh, endoscopic surgeons on the panel, I think. I can't see the panel list, the, the attendee list, but there's a, like a well over 100 and just the names that are coming out. So uh, please feel free to chime in. Would you agree that um, you notice a big difference between a microdiscectomy or a laser uh, endoscopic discectomy? Because if you did, it would be kind of what you would see between an MIST lift and an endo T lift. Because let's face it, an MIST lift is a great operation. My mom had an MIST lift, two levels. She's like a new woman. Here's a question, Joel. Do you think any of that could be due to the irrigation? Um, you know, you are irrigating all these inflammatory. Yeah. I think so. I think the irrigation greatly decreases the load of the necrotic tissue that, you know, basically activates your body's repair system, which inevitably involves inflammation, and inflammation is always painful, but necessary. So I think irrigation is really helpful, but I wouldn't know that scientifically. Yeah. I... Um, and here's the most important question. I think MIST lift and, uh, and lateral with posterior percutaneous screws is really good for an ASC practice, but I would say that a good 30 or 40% are gonna have a problem. So you're either gonna have like a 20% call the ambulance and transfer the patient to the uh, hospital situation, which is terrible for a surgery center that in California that initiates a sentinel event. Uh, and if you get too many of those, you'll lose your certification to be an ASC. You get lots of points deducted. Um, so I'm looking for something where I'm pretty confident that the vast majority of people will go home in zero midnights or in 23 hours, 23 hours. I don't want to have to worry about it, that there's a distinct possibility that they may, may, may need to stay two midnights and need to be ambulanced over to a hospital and be admitted through the ER essentially on a ur urgent uh, admission. So when this came up, I'm now thinking, wow, there's going to be some patients that I can do in the ASC or the MIC left and a bunch of patients that I can't, and then those bunch of patients, if I can do an endo T lift, I could probably get to the point where I do 80 to 90% of my one and two level lumbar fusions in an ambulatory surgery center, and you'll see a spring in my step, a smile on my face, and lots of energy versus my typical, you know, cranky, tired, bag under my eyes, drinking Red Bull, because I had to round at three different hospitals before I started surgery kind of situation. Uh, so um, I'm hoping that's gonna happen. Hey, Jill, well, let me ask you a question. There are several people that have their hand up. Um, do you wanna bring people in to let them ask a question or two just to really kind of get even more discussion? So anybody who has that idea, you wanna do it, just raise your hand and we'll try to get you in so you can join the conversation um, real time. Yep, and we're gonna have a back and forth. So what will happen is, if you raise your hand, um, I think we only have three panelists. We can put you in the panelist category and we can see you and we can just ask questions and talk. It'll be much uh, more interesting for me anyway. And then I just wanna say one last thing. You know, some surgeries are fun and slick and makes you look good, right? I'll give you an example. When I do an ACDF, I never look that good. I've got my head looking like over a microscope, looking at this thing, and I've got an assistant. When I do this surgery, I don't need an assistant. I'm not looking down at anything. I don't care if the patient's, you know, 100 pounds or 350 pounds, the same thing. Um, and I get it done really fast. So. Uh, there was a small tiny vessel and it comes from the Shoot, we can't hear what you're asking, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> Dr. McGee, did you have there a question? Is there a chat that we can look at? Or why don't we bring up somebody else while we try to figure out what the problem with uh, his audio can, is? Can we get Dr. McGee? Uh, yeah, I just, had a, I just had a quick question about what you look for in, in a cage 
doing uh, doing Indo T lifts in terms of size and uh, height expansion. All right, what, what what upper limits I guess would you would you put on the expansion capabilities? Uh, well, I mean, if it was totally up to me, I think that the cage needs to get up to at least sixteen, seventeen, sometimes eighteen, depending on where you are, um, and needs to be much more dotic. So the parameters are that it needs to fit down an eight millimeter channel, because I think that number is the sweet spot where it's big enough that you can get something in big, but not so big that you start to go into the endangering the exiting nerve root. Because as you get bigger, the nerve root irritation rates is going to naturally go up. So it needs to start at eight or smaller. Um, and the current device goes up to 14. And I have yet to feel like I wish I had more, but there's going to be instances, especially at 501 with a really uh, wedged um, disc space where it needs to get much bigger. Um, so I would say at least 15. And I, I, I would love to get some lordosis too. The current. Right. Right. Implant. Um, um, I guess I, my question is: You said getting down, getting down an eight millimeter tube. I, I thought you said earlier your cannula was, your cannula was uh, with ten millimeter ID. Is that correct? That's usually what you said. Yeah. Or you, yes, the cannula it starts out eight, uh, ten millimeters is circular diameter, but when you get the ID, into right. the disc, it it has two walls that are flat, so it fits along the edges of the end plate, and that's where it gets down to eight millimeters. So that okay. cage is eight yeah. millimeters wide. To make a 10 millimeter wide cage fit in there, probably the cannula has to be 12 millimeters in diameter. And I can just tell you that little, that two millimeter jump is gonna greatly increase the danger to the exiting nerve root. Not by a little, but by a lot. Gotcha. I'm at the end of the talk anyway, so this is a great time to you know, just open it up for regular questions and even people uh, coming up on the panel and asking questions live. So thank you to Eloquence for setting this up and supporting all my efforts at moving the endoscopic procedure uh, forward. Um, honestly, if it wasn't for them, you know, helping me develop the system, I would have just struggled a lot. And Seattle Science Foundation, everyone loves you guys, by the way. Every time I mention you guys, they're like, we love them. Uh -huh. And you can see. And thank you for everyone that's attending. That's the most important thing. And thank you to Daniel, my brother from another mother, for not letting this get really, really boring and tedious. I appreciate it. It was great. Definitely enjoyed it. Okay, Dr. McGee, let's turn on his mic. He looks really right. smart. I'm going to ask a really good question. Any, anybody else with any questions out there? Don't see any hands. You just satisfied all their needs, Troll. <laughs> I, I've heard you do that all the time. But, but isn't, Dr. Isn't, isn't Dr. McGee going to ask a question? He did. He's the one who wants the largest, widest cage he can possibly get. And you shut him down. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, um, well, the future, you know that last slide where I said there's more work? I think um, there's a bunch of things, but one low-hanging fruit is to figure out a way where you can do the discectomy and end plate prep out loud <laughs> from the border of that long surgical corridor, and then two, have an implant that will go in uh, and get both taller and wider, and Jeff Rowe, already has an implant like that, and I think he's trying to miniaturize it down to, down to eight millimeters uh, width. Turns out miniaturizing from 10 to eight on an expandable device that's metallic, it's really difficult. There's something about the physics and the ratio that change. Uh, so if Jeff's still around, I'm curious to see how he's doing with eight millimeter cannula, because as soon as he comes out with that, I want to use it. Um, but there's lots of things that we can do, including figuring out a way to go bilateral where the contralateral side is not as formal of a, you know, discectomy and unplay prep. It's much more of an anterior column support strategy, like when we used to do, like uh -huh. when we just first came out, just do a sloppy, you know, inner body. You just use it for anterior column support and just use one side to do the anterior column support and the fusion. That's kind of what I envision um, the bilateral approach to be the slickest, but I think that's how we can get a much wider implant because it would be nice to get to the point where we can do much more aggressive reductions and realignments. I like that idea. So when do you want me to move to San Diego to do that with you? <laughs> Yesterday. It would be good. If we're practice partners, me, you, Jeff, who else is that, Ray? We'd have a good time. We could 
create the Laser Spine Institute for cool people. That's right. There's got to be one other person that's interested in asking a question, isn't there? Yeah, if anybody wants to ask a question uh, to Dr. Kim, raise your hand. We'll bring you to speak to him directly. Um, you know, we invite everybody that would like to ask a question, just discuss anything. Open floor right now. I just realized it was 3.20. I didn't realize we were well past an hour. I think we have nine more minutes on the thing, but I didn't think we were going to last all hour and a half. <laughs> what, I have one last question, guys. Are, aren't you worried about subsidence at all with, a, with such a small cage when it gets you know, down to eight millimeters? Totally. I'm so petrified of that. And the way I deal with that is to just be so anal during the end plate prep, um, having perfect lateral fluoro, watching all my instruments under lateral fluoro, you know, pretending I can practice. I'm like Helen Keller, feeling all the ridges as I do the uh, scraping. Um, and then I use that long, expandable cage. You know, and, and that's you the thing. my first three, my first 10 cases, the subsidence rate was horrific. I mean, it's just so embarrassing. The patients are still doing great, but um, uh, I think I just got lucky that there's going to be a situation in the future where um, my success is going to be completely dependent on maintaining that inner body realignment. But I've been pretty good the last 15 cases with the new techniques. So I'm confident that. If you're anal like me and don't take your OCD medicines and you have those two tools um, and you have the ability to get good lateral fluoro, that you'll be able to do a good inner body reconstruction and avoid uh, issues with subsidence, even though the cage is only eight millimeters wide, because I was very worried about that. In fact, when I do an MIST lift, I almost always use a 12 millimeter wide cage because I notice when I use a 10 millimeter wide cage, it subsides. So even though this eight millimeter cage has been around for like five years, I only started using it a year and a half ago because I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, Jim, you said, ah, Joel, forget it. It's fine. Just be careful. And he ended up being totally right. Dr. Kim, can, uh, could I ask you to, to unshare your screen? Perfect. Now we can see everybody that uh, comes in to uh, discuss. And uh, well, uh, well, everybody has, a, you know, if anybody has a question again, please raise your hand so we can bring you in. But I do want to uh, let everybody know about an event that we're going to host next week with Dr. Dr. Kim. So I'm going to bring up a, 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 oh, we have some raised hands. All right. That's uh, Dr. Wu. I'm going to bring you in. Okay. All right. You can turn on your camera if you'd like, or just speak to Dr. Kim directly. Yeah, I don't. Uh, can you hear me? So I have a question about uh, is uh, what type of sorry. So thank you. Uh, so may I have a question about what type of cage uh, can be used in and the lift uh, for some uh, current the other available cage? Is it also possible to put with the same approach? Because I know that uh, you uh, need a to put uh, need a tube to put in the expandable cage. But, uh, so is there other uh, similar expandable cage available at present? Yeah, that's my question. Yes, yeah. so there's um, 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 spinal elements. They, I think they bought or got bought by Amendia. And Amendia has that bulleted P cage with the cannula where you can put a guide wire through. So you put a guide wire in the disk space and camera triangle and use that guide wire to drive the this P cage. Now they have an expandable version of that. So you don't have like a cannula protecting everything. You just use the guide wire and pray that the nerve doesn't get in the way. So apparently the people that are doing that are really happy with it. But based on my experience, just passing cannulas down Camden's triangle, I get so much, um, you know, free run EMG activity and I, uh, still get every once in a while a post up with a ridiculitis that really sucks and I spend a lot of time getting getting rid of that or getting that down to an acceptable level that going back to not using a cannula makes me really worried. So I need somebody to tell me that they've done a hundred of them, they keep close eye on it and give me a number of their post up with ridiculitis rate. They can't say zero. They have to give me a number that I can believe. If it's two or three percent, it's pr mine's like one percent. I could, I could live with that. If they say five to 10%, I'd be like, no way. Yeah. But they won't give me that specific number. So I can't tell you that that works, but if you do not want to, 
deal with the cannulas, uh, that would be a good one to look at. And um, a lot of people are working on cannula on uh, small cages that you can put in through a uh, cannula, but um, I don't think they brought it to market yet. I don't think uh, Joymax uh, has brought theirs out to market yet that's expandable. A lot of people have static cages. I strongly discourage you from using that because you'll have to put in a dinky small little cage and I doubt you'll get enough stability to get the results that I've been getting. And there's no need for you to do it unless your hospital for some reason hates globus and is not willing to pay for an expandable cage. I guess that's not that crazy, so it's not necessary. Um, but I anticipate in the not too distant future, there's gonna be a lot of these cages out there, a lot. Yeah, I think Blair Hawk <laughs> might have just got their approval on their small one. Um, I think that might be coming. Um, one of the respondents or one of the participants said the cage you're speaking of is the Omega Lift. Um, yes. Yep. And did he say he used it before? No, he just, he just knew of it. Yep. It's an interesting idea, and I've talked to some spine surgeons that have done a bunch, and they, they talk like me. They're like, Joel, you got to do it. It's just awesome. So I suspect, but I don't know them very well, but I suspect that's going to be an awesome strategy too. But this strategy, you know, I, I, I feel like I bedded it out enough to present it to you guys because if I didn't really feel comfortable with it, I would have just held back until I got to that point. Because I'd hate for you guys to go out there and do something and go, Chul's full of shit. I have a huge uh, problem with this surgery. I don't understand how we can get all those good results. They definitely don't want you to do that. Um, so if you're planning to do a case, please um, let me know how I can help because I, I would love for that case to go well so that you get the same experience I get. And next time you'll be one of the evangelists so that you get up on the panel and go, hi, I'm Dr. Wu. And um, yes, I've done a case like Chul and it's true. They're awesome. Yeah. I won't be satisfied until that happens. <laughs> well, you know, and and so my statement would be, so after this procedure, you do turn your head and say, I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> Every time. It's such a good feeling. All right, just making sure we got you to that point that you put that Band-Aid on and did that. Yeah, if any of you guys are interested in, like, seeing um, the videos that I give to my patients after surgery, if you go onto my YouTube channel, there's a ton of them. You can just see kind of what the workflow looks like. It's designed for patients, not for uh, surgeons, but I think it gives you an idea of what the workflow is like. And like, am I standing like upside down and backwards like I am on an L5S1 and my T-Lift? No, because an L5S1 endo T-Lift, I'm like this, not like this. <laughs> awesome. uh, Dr. Kim and Dr. Leitch, I, I did bring in somebody else that had their raised hand. Uh, Dr. Daya, um, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question, okay? Can you hear us, Dr. Daya? All right, that's not. not can working. you unmute from your side? Yeah, I can, and I'm trying to. Oh. Okay, all right, so. For everyone that's, uh, you know, watching so far, we are trying really hard to figure out ways so that um, we can interact with the attendees more because literally I'm sitting here talking and I have no idea of how you guys are asleep. If we're in a lecture hall and I tell you guys to sleep, I'd pick on you and make sure that you'd wake up, but I have no ability to do that. It's such an unnerving feeling, so. If any of you have ideas on how we can make this process more interactive with the attendees, send me an email or put it in the chat because uh, we're desperate here. <laughs> I'm bringing another another person that had their raised hand, Doc, uh, Dr. Rivera. Um, he's going to be joining as a panelist, and then I will let him speak. Got to do it one by one. So takes just takes. There we go. He. All right. Can can you hear us? Hey, Joel, what's your email? It is ck11 at cholcamp.com. Beautiful. Thank you. Are you going to ask me why 11? Uh, I thought it might be personal. <laughs> no. I think I've seen that movie, This is Final Tap. That scene where he goes, this is the world's greatest amp because these knobs go to 11. 
<laughs> whereas all other apps only go to 10, this one goes to 11. Really? Yeah. I, I do know that. <laughs> so they're like, that's a 10 out of 10. I'm like, not good enough. I, I do like that. Dr. Right, Rivera. Yes. Can you hear me? Now we're yep. I know Dr. Rivera. How are you, my man? Oh, good, good. And you? Good. Yes. I, Thanks for joining. I, I, yeah, thank you. Very, very good talk. Uh, I've been doing a, a lot of endoscopic surgery for about uh, one year, about 13 months. I've been up to um, about 140 decompressions. Uh, endoscopically. Um, I think I'm ready to go and take it to the next step. Uh, I have a question about timing. Uh, is it is it taking you more time to do an endoscopic decompression, uh, uh, TLIF, compared to an MIS TLIF? No, I think I save, um, it takes me three hours to do one level MIS TLIF and it takes me less than two hours to do one level endo TLIF. Okay. It is so much faster and the time goes way faster too. <laughs> Okay, good. I think good. when you do okay. it, if you've done 100 endoscopic discectomies, you are so ready to do the uh, um, endotelus. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't have I the equipment right now right. to do it. Uh, I, I need to start getting, getting ahead on that because uh, I've been doing interlaminars or uh, you know, pyramidal approaches, doing some revisions uh, to fusion masses or uh, revision decompressions through the, through the endoscope. So, for me, it's been great because uh, it's been a whole different ballgame for some patients that I didn't, I didn't have any uh, options or or MIS options. You, in those cases, you need to open up, take down screws, do a big surgery, uh, and this is a very nice uh, procedure to attend to those patients that, that nobody wants, and, and they still have a uh, stenosis or a residual radiculopathy. So I think endoscopic surgery, like, like you said, the, the patients do great. Uh, it, it's a very different, even for the compressions, it's very different how they do after surgery, how, how they walk, how they go back to work. So I'm very, very excited to, to get into doing some uh, fusions through the, through the endoscope too. So great talk, I, would I, I learned a lot from this. That's universal. If you get past that first five cases and you start, you, like if you have a problem in the first five cases, you're gonna go, this doesn't work and give up. If you get mm -hmm. past the first five cases and they go well, and you have a problem, mm -hmm. you'll probably keep going. And by the time you get to 100, everyone says the same thing. It's like, I know the literature does not show a big difference between microdisc and an endoscopic discectomy, but if it was me or my family member, it wouldn't even be close. We'd be doing an endoscopic discectomy. I'd have it on Friday and I'd start work on Monday. If I had a microdisc, I'd have surgery on Friday and I'd hope to go back to work in a week or two. But the, you know, maybe in three years, it's not that big of a difference, but um, there is a visibly obvious, profound difference in the way these patients behave as they recover. Okay. And I think Thank it makes you. a big difference. Month of misery is a big deal. It changes people, I think. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I noticed, yeah, I noticed that. Oh, 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 of Glad course, you said you know, that. Patients do, do very well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring the, uh, the the session to an end, and I want to say thank you to uh, to Dr. Kim and Dr. Leach for such an excellent webinar today. You guys have we know the work that went into this, and to see it in, you know real time really happen, excellent, excellent, excellent job. So thank you so much for you know making this happen with everything. It was superb. So I, I do want to share um, my screen with everybody to let everybody know about the next. Um, webinar that we have with Dr. Troll, Dr. Troll Kim. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Everybody uh, should be able to see this. We'll have we'll be having an event with um, with uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Yu, Dr. Aragi, and Dr. Wang next uh, next Wednesday, uh, 5 p.m. It's going to be a discussion on uh, some case reviews that they've had, bringing some in interesting cases to to the panel to discuss um, some hurdles that they have, some complications, what they've learned. Uh, our goal is to inform you guys of what you what's not in the literature. So we want to give some real life experience from the, these four panelists of cases that they'll bring to the table and discuss it with everybody. So um, we'll send an invite to everybody that came tonight to tonight's webinar. So 
Um, just wanted to throw that out there to everybody so they know about it. And uh, again, thank you, Dr. Kim and Dr. Leach. You know, you guys have been a superb help to, to everybody involved. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. All right. Excellent. Is it just us now? Yep. Yeah, it's just us. We still have some uh, attendees in, but um, yeah, we're, we're going to close out. And... What was that? I have 99 plus. So I have a 60, 57 right now. But during? Oh, during we had, we had about 150. M more. Wow. We had more. That we is insane. A, we, had, we had over 160 at one point I was watching. Got, okay, yeah. I would like to say that Dan did such a spectacular job. This is definitely the least boring webinar I've ever participated in. It was fun yeah. watching you two guys go awesome. back and forth. Great, great uh, back and forth. Really, uh, very strong. Really strong. So, I wish I could see the comments. Was there a lot of comments in the chat box too? Yeah, no, there yeah. was a lot. There was, I'm, I'm, I'm saving it, but it, it, there was a bunch of stuff coming in. Can you turn hey, my I video back on, Scott? I participate still online right now. Uh, Is that true? Yeah, what was that? I don't, I'm, I, uh, I don't know how to turn, oh, here we go, end meeting, but everybody might end up leaving if I hit the end meeting. Uh, so. Okay. I'm not, I just don't want to say anything totally inappropriate or, or brash, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, I can see, how do I see the, why, why can't I see my, oh, here we go, chat. Uh, Ashley. Do you know how to end the meeting for attendees, but not panelists? I do not. I can try and look it up. Let me do a quick Google too. <laughs> Think about that. I think anyway. we hit we hit a lot of the chat. I was able to respond, I think, to a lot of them. Nice work, Dan. And you did a, a great job, Dr. Leach. You really did. I think we were able to get like either incorporated verbally or or not. There were a couple I let go just because they wanted company. They were pushing companies that I thought and that wasn't in. So I'd either answer those personally or yeah. just let it go. So Ray Gardaki is another star in endoscopic. He, yeah. I don't know, I think he started like two years ago and he's just been running. I operated on his mother-in-law too. <laughs> so um, I know him pretty well. He's he's a good guy. We should put him on a fold. But he's a good dude. Yep. Wow, there's a lot of people. Yeah, the sure. chat was going crazy. It was really very busy. That tells me that people are engaged and thinking and participating. I really like the survey we're questions too, sleeping. but I think we do a better job. They were not kind sleeping of at all. Huh? They were not sleeping at all. That, that thing went uh, the whole time. Yeah. The population stayed constant. There was a little up and down, but very constant, very active on the chat. And the That's folks, another good thing. They, and the polls, the polls worked very well. Yeah. yeah. Keep doing it. Uh, I think uh, next week is going to be the ultimate like.